Yeah. So, uh, what I'm going to talk to, uh, to uh, you about today is HTTP 2, uh, basically the current version of HTTP. Um, it's kind of, kind of strange to think about it as a current version because most people, when they think HTTP, they are still rooted in the area of HTTP 1.1 being the, what we know as HTTP uh, today. But uh, HTTP 2 has snuck up on us and has be, uh, basically become the, uh, the new standard. And, and it's being used a lot more places than uh, you might expect. And so what I'm going to do today is to talk a bit about what it is, uh, how it's being built, and how, what, how it affects us uh, in our practical use of HTTP. So in case you want to leave after the first slide, uh, I've provided a short uh, summary of what I'm actually going to say. So the, Major point is, it's uh, HTTP 2 maybe, uh, it gives us faster loading, less bandwidth needs. It uh, allows us to use less inlining hacks when we create web pages and things like that. It provides better concurrent media playback, uh, but it also uh, introduces the hassle of managing certificates, and it's also going to be hassles to uh, do network sniffing and so on in order to uh, troubleshoot. So the long story is that uh, HTTP was uh, initially start, uh, start, uh, Team Berners-Lee started developing uh, HTTP uh, in uh, 1989 and uh, eventually it came out in uh, 1991. Uh, we now know that version as 0.9, but at that point it didn't really have a version number. So when later, when 1.0 came out, they kind of uh, invented the version number 0.9 to refer to this old one. And the first 0.9 version was very simple. You just opened a TCP connection, you sent a, sent a single line of text, a get and the name of a resource, and the server just sent back that resource uh, through the uh, uh, TCP connection and it closed the connection afterwards. So the protocol was as simple as you could possibly uh, get, uh, uh, get it to be. One thing that HTTP introduced about, about the same time as the actual protocol was this idea of the URLs, in which you, uh, the paths that you send in the protocol, those can get reflected into <coughs> a string that both uh, contains the path of the uh, app as well as the machine that you're going to need to talk to in order to uh, request that uh, resource, as well as an indication of what protocol you're going to uh, uh, talk about. And that is a, 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 a thing that has uh, lived on and been used in lots of different other places uh, in addition to HTTP. So, when uh, HTTP 1.0 came out, uh, they, the idea was basically, let's try to um, make this protocol a bit more uh, extensible. Um, uh, so uh, that uh, version, it introduced a bit more complexity to the request response uh, uh, mechanism, in which is, uh, in addition to uh, specifying what kind of resource you wanted, it specifies a, a version of uh, the protocol, as well as a set of generalized metadata for both the request and the response in the form of uh, 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 HTTP headers, uh, containing header uh, names and header values. So in this case, you can see that the, you, the client it, it identifies itself what the kind of application it is, and the server responds with the metadata, like, for instance, so what the, the timestamp of the resource is and what the type of the resource is as, as well. But in general, it's just as simple as HTTP 0.9 in that it's, you do a single request, and you get the response, and the connection closes down. Then, uh, with uh, HTTP 1.1, which is the one that we, uh, up until 2.0 uh, came out, was the one that we've lived with, with uh, for many years. Uh, we got a bunch of additional features. Uh, one of the features was, was, of course, message framing, which basically allowed uh, uh, multiple messages to be sent over the same uh, uh, TCP-IP connection. And, uh, and the way that was done is basically that uh, whenever you have content, you, uh, uh, the, um, uh, either the client or server that sends content is also specifies the length of the content or uses a kind of chunking 
uh, chunk encoding mechanism that allows it to uh, uh, identify uh, the end of the uh, end of the resource by is always declaring, okay, the next number of bytes is going to be uh, uh, content related to this re uh, request and so on. So it will know when uh, uh, the request or response is completed. And that allows you to just basically, the client and service basically send uh, multiple requests on the same uh, uh, connection and the server to send multiple responses over the same uh, uh, connection. And it also allowed for something called pipelining, uh, in which the there was no requirement for the client to wait for the response uh, of a previous request before sending a new one. So that I I instead of uh, uh, sending one request waiting for a response, sending another request waiting for a response and so on, it could just send uh, all the requests uh, over the line and it would get responses <coughs> as soon as the server uh, uh, was able to process them. This pipelining had some problems though. Uh, one of the problems is that initially, if you uh, implemented this, because uh, you have this problem that if the server uh, can't really respond to each request uh, uh, equally fast, then it can come up with a situation in which uh, it might spend a lot of time uh, wanting to answer the request for the first, uh, the first request, and the rest of the request will basically it will have no way of responding to those, even though it has the, uh, the response all ready to send out, it can't send them out because the protocol requires you to uh, send the first response before you send the next ones. So now, uh, this is up to 1.1, which is the one that most people are familiar with. In order to kind of exp uh, explain what uh, um, uh, 2.0 provides, I need to go a bit more into the details of uh, uh, protocol design. But before doing that, I've just mentioned one small additional 1.1 uh, feature, and that is connection setup, in which uh, they, uh, another extensibility mechanism that already 1.1 had was this idea that the client and server could agree upon that they would just switch over to a new protocol as part of the request response uh, process. And that was used, for instance, for uh, allowing uh, web sockets to be implemented. So that, yeah, the client just says, yeah, please upgrade this connection to WebSocket, and the server says, sure, let's do that. And then they start talking WebSockets instead. But now let's talk a bit about abstract protocol design. And usually when you talk, people talk about the networking and so on, it's very tempting to bring up this OSI model, which is a nicely abstract layered description of how a network have never worked. This is basically uh, a fantasy. It's, uh, it's very nice to see theoretical, but it's not actually how things work in the real life. And uh, lots of uh, uh, presenters have been trying to kind of uh, squish what they're actually talking about by saying, okay, this thing I'm talking about here, it fits slightly into that particular layer and so on, but that is really a futile uh, exercise. So let's just ignore this whole thing uh, t uh, now and just look at what we actually are working with. <coughs> so, but we're going to use the same idea. We're going to start down at the physical level and move upwards to uh, see the various abstraction and, uh, uh, and the layering that the, uh, the protocol provides. So let's start, if you start with a wired network connection, then you probably have a gigabit ethernet connection or something. Uh, and then what you're really talking about is five levels of, five levels of voltage going over wires. But basically, the idea that you're sending the voltage signals by changing the voltage of, of, a, lock, of, a, of a, a copper wire or whatever kind of, kind of wire you have. On top of that, you have some uh, electronics on each side of the, that wire that basically uh, encodes uh, 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 symbols uh, over those wires and handles some kind of uh, uh, things like collisions and uh, things like that, which allows you to then abstract this into the idea of the um, Ethernet frames, which is basically uh, uh, chunks of bytes that you send over uh, this type of network uh, segment. And these Ethernet frames can be anything. Um, then on top of that, you have something that gives uh, the, those Ethernet uh, 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 gives us a bit more structure and adds uh, adds some semantics to it in order to allow it uh, to be used on the internet on, on the internet and so on. So TCP/IP is 
uh, uh, one layer that provides a bunch of things that this OSI uh, thing mentions as things useful for, for layers to have. And the specific things are error control, so that you, if whenever you, uh, uh, you, you can tell uh, when something goes wrong. Flow control, so basically the idea that uh, the receiving end can say, no, don't send the, the things this fast because either the network link or, or I'm not able to consume it this fast. Uh, fragmentation, the idea that you can send large chunks of data even though the actual things that uh, uh, can go over the wire is basically the small internet chunks that are small. And that will, the protocol will take care of basically chunking those up into uh, Ethernet frames and on the other side reassembling them back to the, uh, to the size that uh, uh, you started out with. And uh, of course, connection setup, which is uh, some of what you that uh, study TCP have probably heard about the three way handshake uh, that basically uh, establishes a, a, a connection, the uh, uh, SYN uh, uh, ACK. Uh, Packets going back and forth. It's not the, that those details are not important for this talk. So, so just uh, we just need to know that TCP/IP allows the idea of setting up a persistent connection between two clients, and you build that on top of the idea of just sending packets between uh, 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 locations. And of course, addressing, which is the idea of how to identify the endpoints that you want to actually send uh, and receive things on. And that is in TCP IP basically uh, addresses and ports. So the level that most of us as developers work on is the idea of sockets, which is an uh, um, OS level abst uh, abstraction, which gives you basically a, uh, 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 an entity which you can basically read and write sequences of bytes on. And if your protocol is uh, text, then you basically can uh, interpret those uh, bytes as uh, text. And HTTP uh, 1.1 is a text based protocol in the, so that you can basically look at what you are sending and receiving on a socket and you can basically see the flow of the, uh, of the messages. You can see here is a get and here is a response. And everything is nice. Of course, if the body is binary, then you would just see binary data here. But basically, it is easily debuggable and you can understand how it works. So, uh, and this is abstraction level that me, most people are familiar with thinking of HTTP 1.1 of. But in order to talk about HTTP 2, we need to move even one additional level up the abstraction layer and really talk about the, the abstract information model of HTTP messages. So, this is, I, I'm currently representing uh, an example of the information model in JSON, but it, really this is not a syntax that you will find anywhere in particular. This is just a representation. Uh, uh, using a notation that you probably are familiar with in, in order to describe a data structure. Uh, what you usually will find, in, in, depending what kind of language and uh, uh, web framework you're using, you probably see things like uh, request objects and response objects, and they will have access or so whatever to uh, access this type of data model. So if we think of things in terms of this abstract information model, basically what we can, uh, can uh, look at and retrieve from a message and send through a message, an HTTP message, then the idea of describing HTTP2 is very simple. So let's just bring up the information model of HTTP2 and see what the differences are. Uh, the differences is really just that they have a different version number. That's, that's it. So uh, HTTP2 uh, on the message level is it uses exactly the same semantics as HTTP 1.1. Uh, and it, uh, uh, so everything that you know about how to deal with messages are equally valid for HTTP 2. So, and so this is the abstraction level that is most useful to think about HTTP 2. But let's go one step back down the abstraction level again and see what it looks like at the socket le uh, level again if you, when you are you have moved over to HTTP2. So here everything is, is identical, but when you go back, it looks quite different. So yeah, HTTP2 is a binary protocol. And uh, so if you're going to, if you're familiar there with working at that at this abstraction level, you're going to have a problem in uh, uh, trying to make sense of what you see uh, at this abstraction level. Uh, what is actually going on here is that you uh, up here, we, the, uh, the request is, you, uh, 
the, the client is sending a request to you by initiating a TLS uh, um, uh, handshake and so have a response with that handshake and they agree upon using HTTP2 and then they start uh, uh, the communication. Uh, TLS is basically the thing that it allows us to implement things like HTTPS. Uh, uh, previously TLS was called SSL. Um, uh, and it's basically the thing that, it, that provides encryption uh, uh, of network traffic for a lot of different protocols. And since um, it, it, TLS was already a well-known and established standard in HTTP for HTTPS, they basically, uh, we already had a mechanism for exchanging and uh, 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 exchanging uh, and deciding upon uh, which type of protocol to use for encryption. So they, the client would say, I understand these encryption standards, and the server would say, I understand these encryption standards. Okay, we, we, we both have these common encryption standards that we agree upon, let's use this one. And they're using basically the same negotiation mechanism to choose what kind of HTTP uh, uh, protocol to use uh, when you are establishing an HTTP request. So the client would say, yeah, I, I support both uh, HTTP 1.1 and I also support uh, uh, H2, which is uh, the identifier for HTTP 2. And the server would respond, yeah, I also understand HTTP 2 and I prefer that one, so let's use that one. And after that kind of exchange, then it, the, it, it, because it, they choose, uh, they both chose HTTP2, they would start talking the, the, the proper uh, HTTP2 uh, protocol, which is based on a set of frames. They are starting to exchange uh, uh, frames, and those are, of course, encrypted uh, uh, using the other uh, uh, encryption standards that they both ne negotiated as well. And one of these, uh, these HTTP2 frames basically consists of a frame header and a set, a set of frame data. And HTTP2 uh, basically defines a bunch of different frame types. I'm not going to go into the detail right now about these, but you see in, in the uh, uh, next slides, you will probably see uh, a bunch of these being uh, mentioned. But the idea is basically that both the client and the server is sending uh, these message frames, so the handler specifies what kind of uh, frame uh, uh, that, that it's sending. And Another feature of HTTP2 is that uh, is commonly brought up is this idea of uh, header compression. And the whole purpose of this is basically to reduce bandwidth. And uh, the observation is that if you look at the typical HTTP 1.1 header, there is a lot of uh, uh, common things that you almost always send over the wire. And uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, content is basically uh, static strings that they reoccur regardless of who is sending it and uh, so on. So for things like uh, the verbs get and uh, uh, had the uh, uh, names, use agent, host, and so, et cetera, and so on, those are those standards that they basically said, let's just predefine a dictionary that's, uh, set, uh, that both the client and the service understand. So instead of sending this string, I would just send an index to that dictionary. So that uh, when, uh, user, uh, no, when a client wants to send, uh, send the, the math, uh, a get, they can just send the number of, uh, index number two to refer to that this is a get. Or when they want to send the had the name user agent, they can just send 58 and so, and so on. So that works to, uh, to basically reduce uh, it a bit. And they also have something called Huffman, uh, Huffman coding of the strings, which we will come back to. But even we can, it can, we can even do better than that, in that uh, we, since we have persistent connections, and typically a, the user agent won't change from request to request with over that connection, we might make use of this, that fact to basically remember not only, uh, not, only uh, not only be able to index predefined things, but also uh, create a vocabulary of new things that you learn along the way of the protocol. So, Next request, if you send exactly the same request over the same connection, then basically both the client and servers learn that, yeah, this uh, uh, 58 curl or user agent curl, that uh, thing that we can now just refer to as 63 because we both built up a dynamic uh, dictionary containing that entry. So that whenever you see a new combination of, uh, of the handles and values, you, you basically 
protocol basically goes and adds those to a dynamically built dictionary so that, the, uh, uh, so that eventually what was here uh, a bunch of data got produced to a bunch of indexes and some Huffman coded text and eventually just got uh, produced to a set of indexes and nothing else. There's no need to send any text for it there because the text is the same as previously. Now, Huffman coding, this is, uh, on the right side, by the way, is uh, David A. Huffman, uh, which invented this thing, uh, is basically a way of um, in, in exploiting the fact that uh, when you're sending text strings like a uh, greeting here, uh, certain of the, uh, uh, of the characters are more common than others. So you, Huffman, encoding, uh, Huffman coding basically assigns each, or each character a bit pattern, and just assigns larger, smaller bit patterns for the most common uh, characters or bytes, and assign larger bit patterns to the, the less common ones. So in this case, this greeting here would be basically being folded into this thing, a one byte bit just to begin with that says, yes, so we're using Huffman uh, coding, and afterwards, the D becomes this one, and so on. And if you don't arrange that back into bytes, and pad them so that it fills a full byte, you see that in this case, particular case, you save three bytes by doing so. And of course, with longer strings, you, you, you save more data. Um, one thing that uh, HTTP2 provides, which solves this problem that we talked about uh, when I talked about pipelining, is that it allows uh, the, the both clients and servers to send uh, multiple streams over the same connection independent of each other. Instead of waiting for a chunk of data to be, sun, uh, to be uh, fully completed, you can basically interleave uh, uh, data for multiple requests and responses at the same time. The way this is done is basically that uh, a stream is considered basically a sequence of uh, frames with the same stream number, and as uh, uh, such a sequence consists typically for a request of a header, a, sort of con uh, a header frame, uh, zero or more continuation frames for, the, for additional headers that didn't fit into the first frame. Then uh, some uh, data, uh, uh, optionally some data frames to actually provide body of the messages. A priority frame to potentially tell the, the other side that this uh, stream should be given higher or lower priority, and a window update frame uh, to tell the other side whether to, to uh, uh, increase the, 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 the rate of sending data or reduce the rate of sending data in, in order to make sure that you don't get flooded with data you can't process. And if, uh, for some reason, one of the ends wants to prematurely close down that stream before it's reached its proper end, they can reset uh, the, the stream as well, without affecting any of the other streams or the same TCP IP connection. So basically, each of these frames, they have an identifier that specifies which stream it belongs to, so that all, all of these streams can be interleaved with, with each other. And for each of these streams, you have the ability to control uh, the, uh, the flow as well as the priority. So the, uh, the result of this is that uh, small requests are really cheap. That means that uh, things to be done in the past is not necessarily uh, needed anymore. So one of the things that uh, uh, we previously did as a hack uh, was that if you were, wanted to serve out a lot of different uh, uh, images uh, for icons in a, in a uh, web application or whatever, uh, whatever you would uh, do tricks like sending all of those images as a, a single large atlas of, uh, of uh, uh, images, and then you would you place that whole big atlas uh, on the various locations of the uh, application screen that you wanted, and you would use CSS tricks to basically crop down to only show a particular uh, uh, snippet of that large image in order to pick which kind of icon that you wanted. And that, the benefit of that was that you had just a single HTTP request over the wire uh, to get all the icons that you needed instead of having multiple HTTP requests. And that was a big gain in the past because uh, multiple HTTP requests was costly in the past. But now, basically, those kinds of tricks are really not needed anymore. There are other things that we uh, previously did, which has less value, but not, is not completely useless. Things like inlining uh, 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 
content in resources like inline JavaScript and CSS in HTML and so on, and uh, basically doing things like taking a lot of small JavaScript files and bundling to, them together in, into a large one. They are not less uh, valuable because the, uh, the actual HTTP requests uh, 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 are, are less costly. But the thing that uh, you still want to do is basically to uh, think about size and uh, <coughs> code elimination. So things like uh, uh, you want to do uh, your, your, your tricks for optimizing the size, compressing the images in the, in the right way, minimizing the JavaScript and so on, and using tree shaking algorithms to basically just do, uh, take the, the JavaScript that you have and just re remove everything that you actually don't need so that it's not going to be sent over the wire at all. Another consequence of the HTTP2 uh, is that um, there's no browser connection limit anymore because the, uh, for a given server, the browser is just going to uh, uh, open one connection and that's it. It doesn't need it anymore because there's no kind of uh, there's no benefit for uh, for introducing additional connections because none of the traffic over that single connection is going to be blocked by all the traffic uh, going uh, to the same uh, server, and that means that. Uh, uh, in the past, while browsers have done things like limiting the number of requests to a single uh, uh, server to four connections or six connections uh, in order to basically avoid uh, doing a kind of denial of service attack against the, the, the servers, those limits no longer apply. And the one place where those previous limits uh, was quite obvious was if you were basically adding a lot of video elements to your, to your application and you started, uh, and, and that would force uh, these video elements to start preloading the video. And the behavior of people of the video in uh, a browser is basically that it opens a, a, a request and it starts reading that request until it has read enough to pre-buffer uh, uh, so that it can start playing immediately. Once it has enough in its buffer, it will stop reading from that request, but it will not close down the, uh, and reset the connection. Because in the one you, once the playing has actually proceeded uh, uh, further on, it will want to continue uh, uh, fetching things from that request. So uh, video elements have, in the past, basically hold, held uh, HTTP 1.1 uh, connections hostage in the sense that they are they have used up that connection. It can't be used to anything else because it has an active connection and the because the video is not playing or is playing slower than you can transfer, it's not going, it's just sitting there idle. And that meant that you could put up uh, up to six or four video elements on a, on a page, and at that point, all, all the traffic to that, uh, um, uh, to that uh, server just dies because there's no additional uh, 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 HTTP uh, connections available to do any other requests. Uh, but now that's no longer a problem, so you can have as many uh, video elements as you want and you can do, and it won't block any other requests at all. So one of the uh, few additional features, if you are looking at, uh, at the semantics that the uh, HTTP2 provides, is this idea of the uh, server push, in which a server can uh, decide that he, even though the client hasn't requested that a resource yet, uh, the server predicts that the client is going to request it soon. And therefore, I, uh, the server can just send it without actually the client requesting it so that the server, the client, will have it at the point in time where the client realizes that it actually wants it. Typical examples of, of this is that if you're serving an open HTTP uh, or HTTP um, HTML page, and that HTML page needs a CSS file to re render it, then uh, the, the server might just as well send out the CSS file uh, at the same time as the uh, as the um, HTTP file, uh, sorry, uh, HTML file, because the client is going to need it, and that's basically the equivalent of inlining it in the HTML. But you don't need to use those kind of inline tricks to make it work. And um, the implementation of this is basically the same that uh, for re uh, regular requests. The server responds with this uh, header, continuation data, and so on. But uh, in the cases where um, uh, where the server just wants to push something, then it does exactly the same thing, except that the first uh, frame that you have is a push promise, which is also a type of header uh, uh, frame that contains headers. 
but it is uh, it's, it's considered separate because it's uh, one that was not explicitly requested. But it, it also opens a new stream which uh, you, you can send data over. And currently, some browsers and some uh, servers support this. Um, so uh, for HTTP 2 you basically want your server to support it, in that uh, this, you want a server to realize that when you're sending out uh, uh, one resource, you want to send, have it send out another resource. A common way uh, that uh, this is implemented is this idea that you have a link header, uh, that your application or whatever that uh, feeds data into the web browser on the server side uh, sets, so, and it specifies additional resources that it wants the client to preload. And if the server itself then realizes that the request is building contains one of these link headers, it will basically then also issue one of these push promises for those resources. <coughs> but also, um, this, standard here, uh, this standard here also allows for clients uh, to take advantage of this if the server doesn't have this support. So uh, some browsers, when they see this link header themselves, they will actively go in and ask for that, uh, that thing uh, as well. So that uh, if the server doesn't support HTTP push, then uh, you get some benefit of it, or even though the server does not uh, uh, support it. And that's a standard that is really independent of HTTP uh, 2, but it, it can be looked at as a graceful fallback. Uh, and it's implemented in, uh, in, in the current uh, Chrome versions, and it's, go and it's also being implemented in the future versions of most of the other browsers as well. So for per server push itself, there is a bit scattered uh, uh, way of uh, supporting it. So this is just an overview of what you can expect from servers. So uh, these are some very uh, um, commonly used servers, and uh, most of them support HTTP2 uh, at this point. And, um, but they have different approaches for how they deal with server push. So Apache does headers, uh, and Nginx uh, supports headers as well, but they also support defining custom rules, ISA. I ask, you need to use an API uh, at your application level to basically tell it to do server push and, and so on. Get is interesting in that it tries to automatically figure out uh, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of um, uh, relationships that exist between uh, the various resources and then uh, uh, basically send out server pushes after that um, uh, based on what it has recognized. And it's basically using the refer headers to basically identify the dependencies between resources on the fly so that it can be optimized later on. So that's all of the good things about HTTP2. Now let's talk a bit about the more difficult part. And one thing, of course, is that uh, in practice, HTTP2 is heavily reliant on HTTPS. The standard does define using this upgrade uh, uh, mechanism, uh, connection upgrade mechanism for, of HTTP 1.1, uh, a way for it to work with HTTP uh, unencrypted HTTP as well. But basically, uh, browser vendors uh, have been reluctant to implement this because they look at this as an opportunity to kind of push HTTP as uh, and security on uh, the industry uh, as well, which is, does make sense uh, because uh, yeah, it's about time we start using encryption for things, but it's going to make things a bit more difficult to actually work with. So, when you do, uh, uh, so the big uh, downside, of course, or, or hassle with it, is that you need you're going to need to start thinking about the, uh, creating HTTPS certificates and deploying them. Um, so, if you are doing an in internet website, you just get a, a certificate from a certificate authority, or use something like uh, Let's Encrypt, which gives you uh, free certificates in, in easy fashion. But if you're going to do things like doing testing on the intranet, or, and so on, things come, become a bit more complex. Uh, um, especially in that uh, um, many organizations use naming conventions for their machines internally, which are not valid external uh, 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 domain names, which means that you can't get officially supported uh, certificates for those from uh, uh, authorities, which also means that uh, you 
a need to do self size certificates, which also means that you need to basically deploy uh, those self size certificates uh, uh, or use of them towards all the machines you're going to test on so that the client actually trusts the things that you are setting up. And there are certain uh, gotchas, like for instance, you don't want to issue localhost certificates for products that you create uh, that uh, you install on customer machines because that is a secure, uh, for some vague, uh, some, some of the very detailed reasons, is a security risk. So it allows others that you can get hold of that software, which of course then contains the uh, private key of that, those certificates in order for software to actually do, uh, do uh, talk to them in the local. They can misuse that private certificate and uh, uh, exploit uh, machines that have your, have your software stored uh, uh, on it, which is not a good idea. So, in terms of debugging, uh, if you have a recent enough version of curl, uh, you, you have you, it supports HTTP2. Uh, you can force it to use the HTTP2 by uh, using this option, and you can check whether your curl version supports it by looking at uh, these features. HTTP2 is something that, if you're compiling curl yourself, uh, requires an external library. So you would need to basically uh, uh, make sure that you uh, obtain the uh, uh, I think it's an uh, library in order to uh, actually get that feature uh, when you're compiling it. And uh, uh, the current state of uh, distribution, Linux distributions and so on, is that it's slowly trickling in uh, curl versions with HTTP2 uh, uh, support, but it's not there or there yet. So you might need to compile this thing yourself or grab a binary, if you're on Windows, uh, grab a pre-compiled binary from a location that you trust. Um, so, curl is good when you are just testing the client side of an API that you are testing on. Sometimes you do want to test things by doing in-flight network analysis. Basically having an existing server and a, a client and just see what's going on over the network. And uh, in this case I would strongly recommend you, you, you uh, look at using proxies instead of using sniffing because proxies are pretty easy to get working well uh, while sniffing is uh, pretty hard to get working correctly. So the pro uh, regular proxies that you might be familiar with like Fiddler, Charles and uh, man in the middle proxy and so on, they support HTTP2 and are pretty okay and easy to set up uh, to get this uh, working. The documentation is usually pretty okay and describe step by step how to do it. Sniffers are hard, and that is because uh, sec uh, the security mechanism in the HTTPS is actually working, which is good. These guys uh, here makes it particularly difficult in that. Uh, it, even though you know the private key of the server, you, even though you, you, that, then you can't really just uh, sniff the traffic and decrypt the traffic because they have a key exchange which basically defeats these kind of man in the middle uh, attacks, uh, or not man in the middle attacks, but the sniffing attacks, even though the, all the secrets, the depreciated secrets uh, uh, and private, private, private keys that uh, have been issued are known to the attacker. But there is a way around that as well which is this uh, NSS keylog format, which is the idea that when uh, you, uh, the, the clients and servers are negotiating over what kind of uh, uh, encryption keys to use, uh, they base, if that client is based on something that supports this, uh, uh, this standard, you can tell it to basically uh, log those uh, uh, keys to a file, and then you can just point to things like Wireshark to it, to that file, and then the Wireshark will be able to decrypt it without any problem. So this is an example of how to uh, uh, use curl, which is implemented using OpenSSL, and OpenSSL has this uh, environment variable it looks at. So if you set that environment variable, it will uh, 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 encrypt the traffic that goes through SSL, will basically um, make <coughs> as, uh, open as a cell, log uh, the uh, client random value that it has been uh, negotiated in, uh, so that it can then be used to uh, communicate to, to use it. Honestly, I have never used this uh, myself. I think I find it too much of a hassle. I prefer using the proxies uh, as well. But the option is there if uh, you want uh, to, to look at it. So. Let's now do a small demo of HTTP2. It's gonna, I'm gonna warn you, it's gonna be very anticlimactic. It's not much to see. 
So let's uh, go here and just do https colo slash slash google.com. Yep, that's a good demo of HTTPS <laughs> as HTTP2. So uh, basically, Google has been running HTTP2 for a very long time, even before it was actually called HTTP2. They had the previous iteration of it, it was called Speedy, and uh, before it became a, a standard. And uh, it, it, the idea here is, of course, we are working, as long as you're working at the proper abstraction level, you don't really realize that you are using HTTP2. <coughs> and most of you have probably been using HTTP2 for a lot of, the, uh, of uh, both web traffic and talking to APIs and so on without really realizing because libraries uh, and the servers that you've been talking to just already support it. And the semantics of it, it has been exactly the same. And you can also look at this, at this in this level. If you now go and do this again, I'll just go and do that. And uh, by having developed the tools open, you see there are all the requests and responses. And I have a, a look at the first one, for instance. Um, I'll try to make this a bit larger so that you can see this. So inside of here, you can take a look at the uh, headers that was uh, sent uh, and the response headers. So the headers was uh, sent here uh, are these. The regular headers that you're all familiar with as, uh, as usual, and the response headers, all the headers that you are familiar with. But this is going over HTTP2. Um, and, uh, we, but because the tooling that we have here is working at this higher abstraction level, we don't really realize this. Um, one thing that is a hint to us that it's actually going over HTTP2 is that all of the other uh, names are just lowercase. And that is because the, this dictionary approach basically means that there is, there is actually no uh, uppercase, lowercase information being sent uh, from the client and, and servers, uh, so that there is no way to basically send a capital content length uh, 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 using this protocol. And uh, um, another interesting thing here is as, as well, this um, org service thing is quite interesting in that uh, Google has been busy. So after the replacing the HTTP protocol, uh, so in, that of, uh, in the, in the protocol stack of layers that we have, they are busy also replacing the TCP IP uh, layer. So this port service thing here has something called quick, which is a replacement for TCP. Because they found some deficiencies in TCP as well, I mean, basically they have three-way handshake and so on and found out, yeah, if we just design a new protocol at that level as well, then we can get even better performance. So they are also replacing TCP uh, behind the scenes. <coughs> we don't really know about it because we are all working at the higher abstraction level. So, that's, that is basically uh, it. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> it's a bit unclear where TLS fits into the stack. Does it sit between TCP IP and HTTP or H2? So, there is this a philosophical question of uh, well, uh, how, we, if you're looking at an abstract layering model of where it sits, mm -hmm. or is it rather how it fits into it? So, it's more of how it fits. So, the okay. so, when you open it, so when you type in, um, let, let me do that, when you go in here and type HTTPS colon something. Then basically the client will send and start communicating using TLS uh, uh, to the endpoint. Does it send it over TCP IP? Yes, uh, unless a, 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 the client in this case, which is Chrome, has gotten this, uh, uh, has catched cached information that this quick protocol is being used and then we'll be using quick instead. But let's ignore quick for the moment. Let's imagine that you're using a browser that doesn't support quick or if it's you're talking to watch a server that doesn't, that doesn't support quick. Then it's using TCP IP. So let's go back to this to the stack of the things that we had here. So let's go back to the stack. So uh, we have we are we are via the level, which is not true, by the way, right now, because now I'm using a different uh, layer uh, for this thing here, because I'm on wireless instead, which is an, another replacement for this thing. This is Ethernet frames. That is something that I'm currently doing, because Ethernet frames uh, is the wireless one also provide Ethernet frames. And TCP level is also being used unless you are Google. 
and uh, so yes, all of those uh, parts of the of the stack already exists. And the next part, of course, is uh, this uh, uh, TLS negotiation, which is actually the thing you're talking about. The talking, and probably your the, 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 the TLS implementation that you have is also probably using the socket stream abstraction for doing implementing that uh, thing. So, uh, by the way, so since we've been talking about replacements of the various levels of the stack, there are, uh, especially on Linux, uh, alternate implementations of uh, sockets as well, something that replaces sockets with a different uh, API for communicating uh, uh, with the network stack on, uh, from user space. And, uh, uh, but they haven't really caught on. But uh, there are uh, uh, proposals there because the, the socket uh, standard itself is, uh, uh, is one area in which things are inefficient and you get. You might want to do things like zero copies of data and so on, which you can only do if you replace that part of it. But yeah, so once you, uh, once you, what happens when you type in HTTPS is that the connection uh, is established using TCP IP, and then you start talking uh, TLS over that uh, protocol. You don't yet know which uh, protocol you're going to use. TLS wraps those protocols anyway. So in the first step is this uh, TLS negotiation in which you determine both what encryption standard you're going to use and also what kind of uh, HTTP protocol that you're going to use. And after that, after the TLS uh, connection has been established, then you have using your uh, open SSL or whatever uh, uh, SSL is, uh, or TLS library that you're using, you have a way of sending bytes back and forth uh, while the encryption library takes care of converting that into encrypted data. And, the, and there should be two standard user stats for sending and receiving these uh, frames that it uh, defines. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Dynamic dictionary yeah. that is created on both sides. Um, how do you like make sure that that syncs up? Because I guess if you just use like chronological order, it would not necessarily match up. Oh yeah, the, the chronological order uh, will match up. Uh, if, yeah. uh, in that, it basically there is only one sequence of incoming requests. So and there's only one sequence of outgoing requests. So yes, it, it is it is basically based on chronological. It also has some implications in that uh, you can't that, that predefined dictionary that you have that is predefined in the sense that it is defined in the standard exactly what each of these values mean. So uh, the standard actually contains a long, long chunk of data, which is basically a. Uh, 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 data that is uh, this dictionary, which all the implementations of it basically verbatim need to uh, introduce to it. But yes, there are complex rules for how to update this uh, dynamic dictionary, in that it needs to, uh, it, it, the dictionary can't grow infinitely, so you need, you need to lick things from it as well, and so on. I, I have not looked at the details of how that works. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, similarly on that question, um, so does the client wait for the server to acknowledge the first request before it starts sending dictionary text values? Well, the client doesn't explicitly send. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, I don't think so. Uh, to be honest, I it's details I have not looked at. It's this is the probably things that you only need to know if you are actually implementing at the HTTP two at that level. But I would expect that there's. I don't think there's any good reason why you would need to do that. Well, I mean, one reason would be that uh, otherwise, if you start sending requests with uh, uh, custom custom indexes, then the server won't be able to interpret it until it processes the first request, and then you well, have the same problem. As right, right. So at the frame level, they need to, the server basically need to interpret things in the sequence that they, they come in. Right. The, the asynchronicity that you get is not by delaying interpretation of frames. It is instead by not issuing uh, frames uh, uh, back again uh, in the order that you received the, uh, receive the request, and also the individual streams basically telling the client, please back off, don't send me any more of these, these frames. Okay, and that's why uh, the order works as well, right? Yeah. Because you still process everything in order, but you might just 
keep it on the side and answer something else first. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm a bit on a shaky ground here because I have not looked in the details of how these things are, are implemented at that level. But I believe that the, you, you would typically process each of the requests coming in as they come in and basically use the mechanism of using window update to say that you don't want more, want more frames there. It, uh, uh, to basically say that this stream is should not be, be uh, have importance, or, and also I guess priority can be used for, for that purpose as well, uh, in order to say that you, you should focus on sending uh, uh, things on this these streams uh, before something on these other streams. Yeah, and uh, there's a few other others that I haven't mentioned, like ping, for instance, which you can just check the connectivity speed uh, between characters uh, and, and server, so, uh, and go away, which is the one that uh, takes down the connection. But it tells you, it tells you, you know, now go do a graceful shutdown of the connection. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then, well, then I'm done. So. If